welcome to the wonderful world of, oh, not Disney, PB's wonderful world of ministry. And if we're going to be uh, giving some love to Disney World, which is supposedly the most magical place on the earth, but let me tell you, heaven is going to be a whole lot better, but you got to know Jesus to get there. We are going to look at some of the rides at Disney and some of the attractions, and we're going to tie it back to the Bible with this wonderful book by Albert Sweet called Disney Devotionals. So join with me each time we meet to get a bird's eye view of Walt Disney World and also be able to tie it back to our Bibles. What exactly is PB's Wonderful World of Ministry? Well, it started from an idea of something that I didn't get to do as a child because my family, and thankfully they did, we had a tradition of going to church Sunday nights. And the Wonderful World of Disney here came on Sunday nights just in time for church. So I didn't ever get to see it. That's the days before we had... Uh, DVRs before we had streaming. So if you missed it, you missed it. You never got to see it. The Wonderful World of Disney had several different components to the programming. And so in PB's Wonderful World of Ministry, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to do some crafts. We're going to tell Bible stories. We may make some fun videos. We may play some games. We'll read some Bible stories and we're going to have lots of fun. And we probably have some puppet sketches too. So I hope you're going to enjoy PB's Wonderful World of Ministry. Okay, so before we head off to Disney, let's talk about what we learned this morning in Kid Zone. We opened our Bibles to the first book of the Bible and the first chapter and the first verse. We opened to Genesis chapter one, where we read how God created everything. We learned that God is our creator and our king. Man, I'm tired. Oof. Hey, Camille. Oof. It sounds and looks like you need to take a break. Did you just get back from a long bike ride? Who did I ever? This bike I got from you last week has been so great. It's been opening up whole new worlds to me. Whoa, it must be even faster than I thought for you to travel through space with it. <laughs> I don't literally mean the bike has taken me to other planets, although that would be really cool. I just meant that this bike, I'm able to travel farther than I could on foot. I've already been able to see so much of God's creation. Isn't that the best thing about being outside? Everywhere you look, you can see God's fingerprints. Those must be some pretty huge fingerprints. <laughs> oh my goodness, you goofball. You're always taking me so literally. I don't mean God's actual fingerprints. But everywhere I go, I see evidence of God's creativity. He made everything there is, and I get to explore it all on my new bike. I'm so excited that you're enjoying the bike I built. It makes me happy that you are enjoying God's great creation too. In fact, that reminds me of a Bible story. I was just about to share it with my friends here. Any chance you might like to help me out with it? That sounds great. Let's see how much you remember, and I'm going to have an old friend come by and help us out. Hey, look who I've got with me. That's right, your old buddy Duffy from Scripture Shorts. And Duffy's here to see how much you remembered from our lesson today. So, let's start off with question number one. What did God do to create the world? If you said he spoke... Good job. You got it right. All right. Question number two. How many days did God create the world? If you said six, you got it right. Good job. God arrested on the seventh day. And so should we. Now, question number three. What did God say about everything that he created? Yes, Duffy got it right. Hope you did too. He said that everything was good. All right, you guys are doing great. Okay, so last question, and it's a hard one, so you may have to put your thinking hats on like poo. All right, who is God? Whoa, that's a question that we can't ever fully understand, but we did learn today that God is our creator and king, and he loves us very much. Hope you all have a great day. Look forward to seeing you again real soon. Bye.
All right, where will we go today? Today, we're going to go to Adventureland in the Magic Kingdom to one of my favorite rides, the Jungle Cruise. Walt Disney's Jungle Cruise. I've loved the rides ever since I was a boy. I love the adventure and the animals and all the fun things that you see, and especially the jokes. And now as a dad, I enjoy the dad jokes quite a bit. Now, the interesting stuff about the Jungle Cruise is that it's a boat ride that's been around since day one at Walt Disney World and as well as the one in California at Disneyland. It's one of the originals that Walt Disney himself helped to plan, and from 1955 to 1962 at Disneyland, the ride included a narration describing what you're seeing on your jungle adventure, much like a documentary. But starting in 1962, the ride began producing pun-type jokes into the spiel and hasn't changed since. If you've ever ridden this ride, you know the kind of puns I'm talking about. Yes, they are super corny, they're dad jokes for sure, but that's one of the things that makes the ride great and leads to our devotional thought for today. First of all, did you know that Walt Disney originally wanted real animals on this ride, but he was told that all the animals would be nocturnal and asleep when guests were riding. Therefore, Walt decided instead to incorporate animals that he could control, also known as audio animatronics. For a time, however, there were live alligators in the ride queue at Disneyland. This is also the ride that inspired Walt Disney to view his parks as never complete and always needing change. Apparently, he had overheard a young boy ask his mom to the ride Jungle Cruise, and she replied, No, we did that the last time in, that we were here. What a great mom, right? Hearing that, Walt decided that his parks would always need to change to invite people to come back. The water of the Jungle Cruise is a lot cleaner than it looks. Brown dye is added to make the water look dirty and to conceal the fact that your boat is on a track. Another fun fact is in 2004, one of the boats took on too much water and sank to the bottom. <laughs> Luckily, the bottom wasn't too far, and the boat was recovered and is still in use today. Finally, the Disneyland version features a famous tree just outside the entrance line. That palm tree but dates back to 1896, when the rancher who owned the land sold to Walt Disney requested that that one tree be spared. Walt Disney obliged and had the 15-ton tree moved from the parking lot area to Adventureland, and it survives to this very day. Now, there are many more fun facts about the, this ride, about the Jungle Cruise, but I just don't have time to tell you about all of them. But I do want to refer back to what was made, what made this ride famous, the jokes, the puns, the traditional narration on this ride that makes you roll your eyes and groan with laughter, or at least fake a laugh to be nice. Since 1962, the ride's tour guides have shown you around the jungle with a script that includes many quips and funny lines. Most of them are easy to get, but there are a few that you have to think about sometimes. Honestly, many of them are just so silly that they are funny. As I mentioned, that's one of the main reasons I enjoy the ride so much. I've heard most of the jokes many times, but I always want to hear a new version or hear it for the second time. But what about the Bible? Do you find jokes or humor there? What about humor similar to what the ride, to this ride where you have to think about it to see the humor in it? There's one particular story in the New Testament that comes to mind when the speaker didn't necessarily mean to be funny, but it ended up being a funny moment. Do you have any idea of the story I'm referring to? Take the time to read John chapter 13 and find that story. It's when Jesus humbly washed his disciples' feet. Jesus showed what it truly means to be a servant by getting up and washing each of his disciples' dirty feet. That's 24 feet in all. When he got to Peter, something very important happened. Peter refused, saying, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus basically replied, telling Peter that unless he allowed, he allowed to wash his feet, that he would have no part with him. And that's when Peter made what I think was funny. He said, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. I've always thought that that was funny, and I like to think that Jesus smiled or even chuckled at this time, although the Bible doesn't mention it. Like the Jungle Cruise lines, it was subtle humor that you might have to think about. Peter realized that to be with Christ and truly follow him, he had to humble himself like Christ and allow the Son of God to wash his feet. We must also do the same. We have to be humble like Jesus was. We also have to wash feet, maybe not literally, but we do have to find ways to serve others. At the same time, we also have to follow our, we also have to find ways to serve others. At the same time, we also have to allow our feet to be washed. How do we do this? We do this by accepting the words of Christ. 
We do this by following the words of Christ. We do this by living like Christ did. We are told in 1 John 2, 6, that we are to walk in the same way in which he walked. Are we doing that? I'm asking myself, so ask yourself too. Let's all make sure we try to be imitators of Christ, 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Let's live like he did. When you ride the Jungle Cruise the next time, I hope you can enjoy the subtle humor. Maybe if you give yourself your tour guide an audible chuckle to make them feel good. Also take time to think about Peter. Think about how he made a funny too, and also how Christ showed him and all of us what it means to be humble and to walk with him. Hey, in our next segment, you get to cheer on your favorite rubber ducky. All right. Who's going to win? Okay, so that was an exciting race. How many of you all picked yellow to win? I didn't. I went with blue. But if you're like me, you always are ready for a snack. And a great snack is always a sandwich. You know, what's your favorite sandwich that you like to eat? Yeah, I thought I would hear that. I thought I would hear a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Absolutely. That's one of the best ones. And I love to toast mine. But who likes a fish sandwich? Definitely not me. But that does remind me of today's adventure. It's the story of a little boy who was the same age that you are. And one morning, his mom packed him a lunch before he left the house. And he was on his way to join a big crowd and listen to the words of Jesus. And he had no idea that his tiny little lunch would become the inspiration for one of Jesus's greatest miracles. I hope you enjoy. 
When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus had landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. The disciples saw a big problem. They had a huge crowd on their hands and listening to Jesus, and it was getting close to mealtime. The people needed to eat, and the disciples were probably a little hungry themselves, and they wanted Jesus to send the people away to fend for themselves. That's when the little boy stepped up. He didn't have much, but it was enough for Jesus. Jesus took his gift and used it to bless 5,000 people with a delicious fish dinner. He also showed his disciples and us the reason he had come. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. Jesus didn't come to earth to teach people to fend for themselves. He came to show us how badly we need him in every part of our life. Sending the people away was never an option, so Jesus said, you give them something to eat. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. Because God can meet all needs. And they all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about five thousand, besides women and children. Stephanie here. It is craft time. So today we're going to be making name tags and all you need is an index card, a hole punch, a marker, some scissors, and some string. And if you want, you can also add some beads. So let's get started. Step one is to punch a hole in your card. Wow. Ta-da! Two holes right here. You can choose whatever color you want. I like pink, and I chose pink. Now I also have this special symbol up here. Does anybody know what it means? I think Pastor Brent's gonna tell you. So we've got our two holes right there, and our beautiful name. And let's try to practice writing this symbol right here. Okay, so I went ahead and I put one side of my string through my one hole punched here so that my beads won't fall off. And I'm gonna take my other side of string and put my beads on. So you can put as many as you like. I'll just put a couple. One, two, three, four. Now my beads are all done. And my string is super long. Your string doesn't have to be this long. So I'm gonna take my other end, put it through the hole, and let's tie it together. Doo -doo -doo -doo. All right guys, I'm all done. I've got my beautiful name tag with my beads, and I hope you enjoyed making this craft as much as I enjoyed it. And hopefully next time I see you at church, You'll be wearing your name tag. See you next time. Bye. Bye. Hey, thanks, Miss Stephanie. So, you may have noticed a strange symbol on that name tag she made. The sign of the fish or the ichthus. That was a symbol that the early Christians could write in the sand or in the dirt to let others know that they were Christians too. But it was a secret message to stay away from the Romans. Now, while it's true Walt Disney's one of the greatest storytellers of our time, the greatest story of all time is the story of Jesus. The early Christians were fearful for their lives in spreading the gospel under the persecution of the Roman Emperor Nero. So join our friends, Ben and Helena, and their kids as they keep the stories of Jesus alive. Hope you'll enjoy The Story Keepers. <laughs>